Okay, welcome to the Slow Master Gardeners. First virtual advice to grow by on Zoom. So bear with us if we have any glitches. This is our first time. I'm Peggy Burhan. I'm a Master Gardener and I'll be your moderator for today's program. Um, this program is being recorded. So please keep your microphones muted and type any questions or any problems that you're having into the chat. If it's something um, technical, um, you can send it directly to me, Peggy, or you can um, send your questions to everyone and we will address the questions at the end of the program. You might want to put your program, your Zoom into speaker view, then you can see the, um, the slide or the video that we'll be showing as well as the person who's currently speaking. And as many of you know, uh, the mission of the Master Gardeners is to provide science-based, reliable, practical information to home gardeners. So today's session is going to be on winter pruning of fruit trees. Uh, we're going to have a PowerPoint presentation followed by a video on pruning a neglected orchard. And then you'll have an opportunity to ask our speakers any questions. And at the end of the session, we would like to have you complete an evaluation for the program. I have put the link for the evaluation in the chat, but we will remind you again at the end of the program. We really do appreciate all your um, comments uh, about the program. So please fill out the evaluation for us. And then uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So I'd like to introduce all three speakers and then um, we'll move forward. Rob Kime, he's going to start us off. He's a master gardener with interest in pruning. Uh, seems like he spends most of his time brush clearing and weeding though on his property. Um, he's also the pastor of St. Barnabas Episcopal Church in Royal Grande, and he has past experience in the finance world, and he's also an accomplished singer. Um, his major new pastime though is Zooming with his 17 month old grandson, so he should be an expert at Zoom <laughs> as well. Um, our second speaker is going to be Mike Zinkelman, and he's a certified master gardener with interest primarily in vegetable gardening. He starts veggies from seeds and grafts tomatoes quite successfully. So he's been gardening for 50 years, barely, he must have started when you were, you know, one and or less. And he, <laughs> so he has a lot of experience um, and he also loves to cook with what he grows. Uh, but he enjoys helping others with the gardening. So this is um, great to have him on our Zoom today. And Sandra Fishbein, our third speaker, she's also a certified master gardener and her interests in many areas of gardening, um, but she focuses on propagation and fruit and vegetable production and the espalier of trees, which she's gonna talk to you about today. She's a veteran from the commercial greenhouse industry and a lifelong gardener and nature lover. So of course, all three of our speakers have fruit trees in their yards that they maintain. So they're here to share their knowledge with you. So without further delay, we'll go ahead and start with Rob. Thank you. Um, one other thing to note is I live on a rugged three acre property um, just outside of Royal Grande. Um, we have sandy soil. We're five or six miles from the ocean as the cr crow flies. Um, and um, we're a bit warmer than you might get um, if you were closer to the ocean. So getting started, um, if any of you are already pruning your trees or taking care of your trees or even gardening, you're going to go know a lot of these things already. But sunscreen is very important. Um, protection of your body is very important. I don't know how many times I've had limbs or branches snap into my face, so I can highly recommend eye protection. Pruning shears, loppers, and saws are uh, what we often use, and then sterilizing the, equi the equipment that you're using on the trees um, could be very important to avoid pathogens, uh, hematodes, or even weeds. Um, you can use a rubbing alcohol um, on wipes to wipe down your equipment, or you can put one and a half cups of liquid chlorine bleach um, into two gallons of water um, and use that to sterilize your equipment as well. Here are some pictures of the tools of the trade. I think I'm guessing many of you have these already. The pruning shears, the saws, saws often come in many different sizes, and then the loppers. Um, the loppers that I like actually are ones that are on a pole um, that have a string that you can pull because you can reach much higher up into the tree. 
Um, so you'll recognize many of the tools of the tools of the trade um, that you already have here. Sharpening the tools. Um, it's important to have sharp tools. We're not gonna go through um, this in great detail. We've done that in years past, but here are some of the things that you would need to sharpen your tools. Um, and these are actually in order. Start with your bathroom cleaner to get off some of that rust and dirt. Use steel wool and then a flat screwdriver. Um, and then you've got several different tools here to get that sharper um, blade uh, uh, edge. Um, and then finally, use some ordinary household oil um, to wipe down the tool as you finish there. Winter and summer pruning. This is the main reason that you are all here. Um, many people know that there is winter pruning, but there is also summer pruning. And there can be a lot of similarities between them, um, but there can also be differences between them as well. Winter pruning, we just did our winter pruning in our demo garden um, uh, in January, and we pruned in my own home garden um, also in January. But here in February, um, yeah, you can also prune one thing to note not to prune in the winter. Um, and that would be your apricots, aprium, and cherry trees. Um, they will not do very well if they get wet soon after you prune them. You do wanna select pruning in the winter um, when you think you have a seven day window of no rain, which unfortunately we seem to have right now, again. Um, and uh, that would be true for all of your trees. Winter pruning though, um, you're really strengthening the tree um, by uh, uh, enforcing or building well-placed scaffolding branches. Um, you are uh, removing some of the dormant buds so that other buds will uh, be invigorated. You're removing anything in the winter that's dead or diseased, broken, crossing over other branches, or even moving into the middle. Um, of the tree. And you'll we'll hear Mike speak in just a moment about opening up the center of the tree. Um, one thing to note is that I think it can often be easier to see the diseased wood on the tree. It can be easier sometimes to see that in the summer. But you may notice that on the bark of the tree in the winter as well. When you're pruning off the dead stuff and the diseased stuff, don't just leave it under the tree. Actually get rid of it. Um, take it away um, so that it can't reinfect different other parts of the tree. Um, uh, different amounts of growth that you're gonna wanna re uh, remove in your winter pruning, 50% of last year's growth on fast growing trees, and we'll look at those in just a moment, and 20% of last year's growth um, uh, in the figs, apples, pears, and plums. Um, one thing to note about winter pruning, when we were pruning in our demo garden in January, we had done such a late summer pruning that we really didn't have as much winter pruning that we needed to do. But it, that is my segue over to summer pruning. Summer pruning can be done, um, in, especially in July, and I think we did ours in August. Um, but this is how you can maintain the size of your tree. Um, you can um, especially cut off those um, branches that are fast growing up and way above where you're going to be able to reach to get to any fruit. Um, you can open up the canopy so that light is able to get inside. Um, and um, this will actually, uh, you can remove the vigorous upward shoots, um, which can often get quite tall in a short amount of time. Um, and you can remove up to 30% of the uh, foliage um, at this time as well without harming the tree. Mike. I'm on it. Okay. Um, I wish I, I, I appreciate Peggy's comment early on. I, I wish I could say that I started gardening when I was one and still gardening 50 years later, but I'm afraid, <laughs> I'm afraid that isn't the case. <laughs> um, just one other comment um, to amplify what, uh, what Rob was saying. Um, in addition to not uh, wanting to prune uh, cherries and apricots in winter, the reverse is the case uh, usually with persimmons and figs, which you, you generally wanna prune only in winter. And, and not touch them in that way in, in summer. Um, preserving fruiting wood. Um, every, every fruit tree tends to produce 
um, on a different year's wood. For example, a, a pomegranate will, will produce on first year's wood, citrus, um, quince. And if you, if you trim off older wood, you're not going to impair your fruit production. However, other trees, I think we can move on to the next slide. Um, Rob? There we go, fruiting on one-year-old and two-year-old wood. Um, uh, you have to start paying a little bit more attention to what you're pruning off, particularly on some of the uh, trees like apples and pears and cherries, where they produce on spurs, either on, on the end of the branches or laterally on the branches. And if you start pruning off too much old wood, you, you potentially can eliminate years of production, particularly in apples and cherries where the, where the spurs actually produce fruit for, for a number of years. One proviso though, again, as I, I keep telling people, be glad most of us, I, I assume there's nobody online right now who pays their mortgage by their fruit and vegetable production. So again, we're, we're all, we're all amateurs in that sense. We're all doing it to have fun. So don't get too wrapped up or too worried if you make a little bit mistake of a mistake. We, we are not generally uh, worried about having uh, the ma absolute maximum production out of our trees. Um, let's move on to the next slide. Types of pruning. There are basically four types of uh, pruning. You've probably all driven through the Central Valley and seen lots of the, the first two. The open center is trees that tend to look like a vase. They spread out from a, from a central base. Modified central leader trees that, um, that grow upright with um, uh, scaffolding branches coming out at different levels. The, uh, you can use either one. The uh, commercial growers tend to use modified central leader more in apples and uh, uh, I believe pears. The open center is much more commonly seen with uh, almonds, with uh, apricots, with peaches, etc. And again, they're definitely trying to work towards the, the highest possible production, but as a as a home gardener, we can use a little bit more of our judgment in terms of getting a tree where we like the look of it. Um, espalier, um, Sandra's going to talk a little bit about espalier, which is a very uh, specialized form of, of pruning. And fruit bush. Um, fruit bush refers to uh, putting several fruit trees in one in one hole. Um, it's another alternative to grafting multiple different varieties onto your um, onto your basic rootstock. Um, a lot of people don't realize that you can put several um, fruit trees in in one hole, and then again, after they start growing, the the pruning is pretty much on the same principles: eliminating dead, eliminating crossing, etc. One proviso, if you're going to put several trees in one hole, um, some people forget you need to have them all on the same rootstock. If one is on a standard rootstock, one is on say a dwarf or semi-dwarf rootstock, you'll, you'll have problems. But as long as they're on the same rootstock, you can go ahead and do that. Um, these are just some schematics of, uh, uh, starting a, a tree with modified central leader, first year your 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 stick, next year and 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 through the following years how you how you prune to get that strong central leader and scaffolding branches. Let's keep going again. Open center, same thing. There are many good uh, university sites and the UC sites where you can find some instructions. And, and tips and diagrams on how to do this. <clears throat> Fruit bush, again, several, several trees planted in the same hole and, and prune it all as if it was one tree. And again, same basic principles of pruning. 
Sandra. All right, uh, this is my favorite type of, uh, of pruning. This is the espalier. This is an example of it. Espalier, basically what you're doing is you're training your fruit tree to a um, scaffold or a fence or a wall where it's providing the support and you're basically making it more two-dimensional. It fits better in small gardens. I have a small garden, so I, I wouldn't be able to have fruit trees if I couldn't do it this way because I don't have enough space. Um, this is an ex there are different styles you can use. What's showing there is a horizontal cordon, uh, but you can also do candelabra. They're very beautiful also. That's another reason to do them. Uh, Belgian lattice is very um, intricate, uh, woven sort of look. And then um, what I'm going to do with some peach trees this year is uh, a more of an informal um, fan style of, of uh, structure. Uh, espalier is, uh, it, it requires more pruning than the other styles. It's almost like the bonsai of fruit tree growing. Uh, you, they say three times a year, but I've done apple trees in this cordon style, and I'm pretty much always out there every couple of weeks nipping off this and that just to keep it in uh, in shape like I like it. So um, it's it's kind of fun if you want to fuss around with a a plant. I think that's it. Go. I think we're back to me for pruning techniques. Um, there are two basic kinds of cuts, heading cuts and pruning cuts. A heading cut uh, basically means you're cutting something off that is not at the base of a branch. A um, Couple of things used to promote lateral growth, growth below the cut. Basically the, the, the bud at the end of a branch um, tends to control that branch. And as soon as you cut that off, the hormonal um, milieu, if you will, of the plant is such that buds down below that will start to take over and try to grow out. So one thing to think about if you're trying to keep the center of your tree uh, relatively open and, and with good airflow is that when you start doing heading cuts out on some of the peripheral branches, you wanna look for buds that point the, where the next bud down from where you're cutting points in the direction you want the next growth to go. Usually that means growth outward or upward as opposed to inward and downward. So again, by paying attention to, to the bud below where you cut, you can influence the shape of the tree and how it grows. Um, the angles, and this really applies to any cut, they say a 45 degree angle, depending on how the tree is structured, that sometimes is a problem. But the basic principle is you don't want upward facing flat cuts, which will obviously by gravity will accumulate water if it rains or even if there's a lot of dew as opposed to the water um, flowing off of, off of your cut. And that will help promote the, the health of the tree. Let's uh, move to the next slide. Thinning cuts. Thinning cuts are where you're actually taking off a, 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 a large branch uh, or cutting back to a larger branch. And uh, th these are the cuts that you're using to get the basic shape of the tree, what are called the, uh, the scaffolding branches, which are your, your ultimately as the tree matures, your heavy branches that will be holding your fruit. Key here is if you look at, if you look at your, your um, branches where they emerge you will see a little bit of a of a ridging or a collar and ideally you want to cut back just to but not into that collar and the net result is that you will you will have a a cut that heals better um, contrary to what some of the some people say the the best science right now is that after you make a a a, a pruning or thinning cut that you do not put any sort of a tree sealer on it. Just leave it alone. Um, um, you you wanna be doing it during a dry period and the tree will, will heal itself. Um, 
So again, angled cuts so that uh, water doesn't accumulate right down to the to the branch collar as much as possible. If you leave stubs, basically what you're leaving are, are is is dead wood that will attract disease and termites. Um, next slide. <clears throat> big branches, big branches, large cuts. If you've ever cut a large cut off a large branch and as you get close to the end, the branch drops and rips into the bark, um, join the club. I, I tend to learn by the school of hard knocks. And I also have to stop and think every time how I'm going to make the, these undercuts. But basically, if you're cutting a large branch, your first cut is a small cut underneath. Your big cut is a cut farther out. If the branch rips down, it, it rips into the, the cut labeled A here and leaves you with a stub, but does not go ripping all the way back down to the, to the trunk. You then are left with a much lighter stub that you can take off easily at the collar. Um, and again, um, you need to, sh at that point, you need to shift from loppers to a saw. And, and again, um, it just depends on the size of the branch. Next, next slide. Um, Robert, are you taking over or do I continue? Nope, this one's me. All right. Many of you know that there are many varieties of apples, many varieties of pears, many varieties of apricots. You want to look at the label when you're buying your tree to make sure that you're selecting one that is appropriate for where you're going to be planting it. Um, you want to make sure that it's going to thrive in the temperature environment that you have. There may be some differences in the amount of water that is needed um, by a variety. Um, so talk to the person um, uh, where you're buying the plant to, to, to get information about that particular variety or look at the label or look online. Um, to see what might be suited for your um, property. Uh, most of the time when we're working with people to help diagnose what may be going wrong with a plant or a tree, it has to do with sun or water. Too much water and too little water. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're giving your plant or your tree the right amount of water. That will depend on the soil that your tree is in. If you have sandy soil, you may need to water that apple every three to five days. If you have heavier soil, you may need to water only every week and a half to two weeks. So understand the soil that you have your tree in. Um, pests. Can we all just sigh about gophers and ground squirrels for a moment? Um, I tell folks frequently that I am tender hearted and I have trouble uh, uh, trapping and killing gophers, but I'm going to get there soon because they do a lot of destruction. Um, they do for all of us. And this class is too short for us to go into what to do about gophers, but there are many traps. There are natural predators, owls and other things that could eat those gophers. Um, we also, from a pest standpoint, have invertebrates as well, aphids, borers, mealybugs, um, other things that are going to dig into either the leaf and eat away at the leaf or at the branch and the bark. Um, and uh, it's often difficult to tell whether you have a pest or you have a disease. Um, so there can be some detective work that needs to be done. And as master gardeners, we are always happy to help you with that. We have hotlines um, that you can call and we can help you diagnose what exactly is going on um, with your uh, tree. Some of the protection that you may want to uh, do for your tree. You may want to protect from leaf curl or powdery mildew. The ways to protect from these and other diseases is to disinfect your tools, as I spoke about earlier, um, but also provide the proper nutrients for your, um, your tree as well. And make sure that when you're watering, don't water just directly up against the, the uh, trunk of the tree because that can uh, promote root rot. Um, but make sure that you're watering out to the canopy of the tree. And that's not only true um, for the hand watering that you might do, but that's true for the drip systems that you would lay. Don't put them right around the trunk of the tree. Um, and I should point out, going back to some of the invertebrate um, pests, that some of the beneficial predators, these are invertebrates that will eat other invertebrates, lady beetles or bugs, um, green lacewings, um, praying mantis is one that's a little bit larger and we can often see spiders are gonna eat some of those pests. 
um, that would damage your tree and even wasps can be very beneficial as well. Um, we have so many different microclimates here. Back when I started, I said we were what, five plus miles from the ocean. That's our microclimate. We're a little bit warmer. Um, you may even have a microclimate because you have your tree up against a wall or a fence, and that's going to make it a little bit warmer. North and south facing, where you are on a hill. Our property is halfway up a hill, which means that we're protected from some of the cold, and we're also protected from some of the wind. Um, so make sure that you are selecting a tree that's good for your particular mic microclimate, especially chill hours. Many people don't realize that Fruit trees actually need cold weather, weather in the winter um, that is usually less than 45 degrees. And this would be cumulative between November and February, beginning of November and end of February. And because of our different microclimates, you can see with the third bullet here, Atascadero often gets a lot more chill hours hours in which the temperature is less than 45 degrees. Napomo is only 428. And you can see some of the other breakdown here as well. It's important again for you to have a variety of your tree um, that meets the chill hours that you get in your climate. And there are actually websites out there that you can look at to see how many chill hours you get um, in your particular location. Um, and if you don't get any enough chill hours, you may not get fruit. So chill hours can be very important. Uh, let's see. Um, right size tree for your space, um, rootstock. You, we have dwarf stock, rootstock. We have semi-dwarf rootstock. And we have what I guess I'll call regular rootstock. The rootstock will help determine the size of your tree and therefore also the size, the number of fruit um, that are generated. Um, if you have a small space like Sandra was talking about earlier, you're going to want dwarf and semi-dwarf um, root stock um, on your tree. And again, you can tell that by looking at the label when you're purchasing the tree or online when you're purchasing or talk to the, um, uh, the person at Farm Supply or wherever else you may be buying your tree. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, um, one other thing to say about watering is um, avoid frequent light watering for your tree as this will create a shallow root system. Um, less frequent, deeper watering will make sure that your uh, tree is better able to um, survive drought, actually, and the roots go deeper down as well. Uh, pest management, I've already talked about. Soil amendment and mulch. Um, uh, often your tree is going to need some soil amendment. For example, with apples, you're, you're probably going to have to use a nitri nitrogen um, based fertilizer in the spring or after the harvest of the fruit. Um, and sometimes apples, for example, are going to need a zinc supplement as well. Mulch then um, over the uh, roots of the tree are going to help um, keep the moisture in the soil and they're going to help prevent weeds as well. Um, if you're uh, uh, planting the tree um, and or even just amending the way the soil is, um, make sure that your water is able to run away from the trunk. Again, we don't want water pooling up um, right around the trunk as that will promote root rot and other diseases. Um, and um, often, um, if the trunk of the tree is getting a lot of sun in the summer, you may want to whitewash and use um, um, some paint. Um, to uh, protect the trunk of the tree. Uh, spacing of the trees, uh, you don't want them to be too close together because you'll have poor growth. But as Mike said earlier, sometimes you may even um, plant multiple trees of the same rootstock um, in one hole and then treat that as a bush um, or treat that as a tree um, all together. Sandra, over to you. All right, thank you. I just planted uh, my orchard, quote unquote, um, five trees and that I'm going to espalier against a, a fence, anyhow, um, two days ago. And um, so I used most of these techniques to uh, do so. I got bare root trees. The advantages of bare root trees, they're cheaper. Uh, they have a tendency to have 
uh, more root mass than a containerized uh, or potted fruit tree. They um, often take off faster and um, they are easier to handle as far as getting them around, getting them to your site. The disadvantages are you have a short planting window. I picked mine up from Bay Laurel Nursery on Tuesday and planted them the same day uh, because you want to plant them before the buds uh, break. So, uh, so the window is now. And the other disadvantage, I, I don't know if it's really a disadvantage, but you kind of have to fight your instinct and you have to prune hard um, right after you plant them. And that's there you see, this is one of the plants I planted the other day. and It was twice that size. I uh, had a lot of nice branches way high, but I wanted to uh, bring it down to 20 inches. So uh, that left me with a big old stump. Uh, but if you think about it, that's already, the bare root means that it's already had its roots cut dramatically. So it doesn't, we really want it to focus right now on growing more roots before it sends out shoots. So uh, that's why that's important. Um, maybe go back to the previous slide real quick. All right, hole. So you dig a big hole, they say twice the size of the root mass. Um, then I put in a gopher basket to Rob's point about gophers in this area. They're always going to come back. So I put in a gopher basket. Uh, and then as far as the, oh, the orientation of the bud union, if you look at that picture, you can see there's like that little angle there. That's where the root, um, the root is grafted to the scion material, the fruit wood. And uh, in one direction where there, where if you have like prevailing winds that are very strong, you want the wind to be pushing a, that wood, uh, the fruit wood into that graft union, not away from it, because that can be a weak point. Uh, for me and SBIA, it doesn't really matter because I'm gonna be supporting it with my structure, but, um, but if you do have a wind issue, that's a good idea. You want to uh, put your, uh, it's kind of a two person job to plant it. You want to be sure to plant at least two inches below that graph. Oh, no, sorry. You, yeah, you want the soil to surface to be at least two inches below that graft union. Uh, two to six inches is the recommendation. So, um, so it's nice to have one person holding the, the uh, bare root plant and then the other person putting in the soil around it. Um, they suggest don't fertilize it right off, um, uh, just so that you're not burning any new roots that come out. You can do that later on, maybe next year or later on in the growing season. Um, slope the soil away from the trunk. Uh, that's a good idea for, for everything Rob said. Irrigate it heavily right away, but then let it dry out. Uh, roots actually need oxygen to grow. So you don't want to keep watering this, this uh, stump. I mean, it doesn't have a lot of leaves that are using water anyhow. And um, so a lot of people overwater a bare root tree. So try to let the soil dry out some in between irrigations. And then head it back. There's that picture. You can go back to that picture again. I mean, there's hardly anything left. And that's a hard thing. It was a hard thing for me to do. I don't like to, to toss out a big half of what I just bought, but uh, it's good to, uh, you have to, to prune it back to get good growth. And then whitewashing is just taking a latex or water-based paint, diluting it to by 50% and painting up to, from the from the soil line up to the uh, lower branches, um, just so that you, um, it, it protects the, the uh, trunk from insects to some degree, but also from desiccation. So, um, and another good reason to do that is if you bought your bare root plants from Bay Laurel Nursery, they will not uh, warranty the plant if you don't do that. <laughs> So 
uh, I think at this point we're going to go on to our video of um, rehabilitation of an orchard. Well, today we're in uh, Rob Kimes orchard. Uh, he inherited it a couple years back and uh, it hasn't been pruned in quite a while. So it should be an interesting demonstration on how to rehabilitate an orchard that hasn't been uh, uh, pruned in a while. So Rob, uh, take it away. Sure. Um, we have been here about five years and it wasn't until about a year and a half ago that we got water under control. We do have 10,500 gallons of rainwater catchment up at the top of the hill here that feeds this. But like I said, it wasn't until about a year and a half ago that we got the drip system fixed. This tree that I'm standing in front of right now is an apple tree, a small one. I'm not sure if it's on dwarf or semi-dwarf. Almost uh, uh, all, as Sandra said, almost all of the trees that are here were planted and already in the ground when we bought the property. This particular tree, though, was actually almost sort of out of the ground at one point. And we put the roots back in the ground and rehabilitated it, and you can see that it did start to grow again. This tree needs a couple different winter cuts. You can see this branch right here is getting rather tall. And then there's a lot of branches going into the center, um, even for a small tree. So the first thing that I would do is I would take um, these and I would go right about here, above some of the spurs. And then I would look here in the middle and look at what's crossing over and crossing over here as well and crossing over here, cutting these branches off entirely. Here we have some newer growth, but I'm gonna leave this new, small new growth here and this newer growth here, cutting some more that are crossing into the center once again, and really just cleaning this tree up um, with some uh, uh, cuts of entire branches. And I always say that pruning a tree is a little bit of art. So I'm sure if Mike was over here, he might be doing it a little bit differently than I'm doing. Cutting that branch off because it was going into the ground. And there's another one over here that's also getting pretty low to the ground. And I'm gonna take that off with these larger cutters. a branch that's crossing over so I'll take this off and another one Mike do you see anything else that you would do this is Mike Diegelman another master gardener there's his legs okay there you go <laughs> we got Mike So the other thing when, in a situation like this where not a lot has been done for a while, um, and these trees are so, so small, I think they're a little bit stunted, not only by the rootstock, by having been starved of water. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think I would tend to be somewhat gentle, you know, and then now that they're getting more water, kind of see what grows. Mm -hmm. And also with apples, Generally, we, we give them both a winter and a summer pruning. So, you know, you're certainly not going to have a lot of problem with this thing getting, you know, out of control and too high to pick fruit. So yep. I think I would be gentle at first. I think just with what you've done, mm -hmm. um, I suppose, you know, I might consider taking this branch off and opening it up the center, but I don't think it's critical. And I think we could just let it go till summer, see what, see what, what leaks out. Sure. Do you want to take the next tree? Yeah, well actually this looks like somebody had intended to do three trees in one hole, which I think we've probably talked about on the PowerPoint, <laughs> and uh, which is perfectly fine. You can put several trees of the same type in, in one, one hole as long as the, the rootstocks are the same. Um, and it looks like to me like somebody tried to put three trees in this one hole. This this poor little guy is basically dead. I think he can be just can taken take out, out at some point. Yep. And this one is obviously growing a lot less well. 
than the other one. It's got a label on it from Cal Poly and Rare Fruit Growers, which says semi-dwarf rootstock. It doesn't specify exactly which rootstock, but I, w I almost wonder if maybe somebody mismatched the rootstocks because they look so different. But this is, this is again, this is another apple. Um, on the presentation, you uh, heard about different ways to prune trees, the uh, open, open center or, or a vase or a, uh, um, a central leader type situation. Apples, like, like this one, looks like an apple, at least commercially would, would traditionally be, be uh, pruned to a, a central leader. And it looks like somebody may have started or tried to do that and then kind of, kind of lost it. And the principle of a central leader is you get, a, again, you get a central stem growing up, top it, um, further stems will grow out, ideally, perfectly north, south, east, and west, four of them, but in reality that never happens. But then let them grow out as, as scaffolding branches, and then where you cut it off, it'll, again, start forming lateral branches pick one of them and let it go up again and 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 you you have a, a central tree that you then ultimately prune a little bit more as you go up so it almost has a I guess almost like a Christmas tree kind of uh, kind of situation now this one it looks like somebody started out maybe trying to, to do a central leader and then it it, it basically got uh, got away from them kind of got lost so again, I'm going to just go back to some basic principles of, of pruning. Uh, one other more comment on apples. Um, apples fruit off of old wood, off of what are called spurs, like these that you see at the end. And so you want to be at least a little bit careful of how much old wood you prune off, because basically every one of these spurs is probably four to five years of apple production. Now, obviously, the new wood will, will give you new spurs, but they may not start producing for the first year or two. So, again, you, you need to be a little bit careful. We so anyway, uh, particularly on things like apples and cherries, you want to be careful which, which fruit off of spurs. You want to be careful how much of the old wood which contains the spurs you, you prune off. And typically what you're going to be looking to do uh, normally would be take off maybe, I don't know, about a third of the new growth every year and leaving some to develop into second and third year growth. And every, every tree has its own characteristics. For example, peaches, peaches and nectarines tend to, to fruit off of second year wood. So it'll grow a year and then the next year it'll produce fruit. So when you're pruning, you're, 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 one of the things you're aiming at is to, to prune off a certain amount of the new growth and leave second year growth for your, for your fruiting. But the other thing mainly, especially with young trees or trees like this, you're not even thinking so much about that as, a, as opposed to, yeah, what can I do with the shape? What can I do with the health of the tree? So again, basic principles, there's, a lot of crossing stuff or stuff that's going to be crossing on this tree which I would just take off and again I'm trying to orient my cuts so that water will run off them and not accumulate on top of a flat cut so you can see that so the angle there yeah and actually maybe I can get even a little more out of that the other thing when you're when you're pruning off these and this applies to any tree. If you come in close, Sandra, you can see at the base of the the uh, twig there, there's sort of this collar of woody, woody tissue. Yeah. And this is kind of a, a going... Let's, let's look at this one better. This one is going to come out and cross and get in the way. So you can see that little collar. And what you want to do is you want to, as much as possible, you want to prune right up to that collar, but not into it, if at all possible. And what you, what you don't want to do, let's find an example, is something like this and leave a, leave a stub. 
Okay, because that stub is just basically going to be dead wood in the next year or two. It's going to attract termites and disease and, and problems. If you prune back to the collar or as much as you can, the tree will naturally over overgrow that and heal much better. Um, the other thing on, on the healing, a lot of people still are on the impression that they should put a sealer on the uh, on the, the cuts, especially the big cuts. The, the current scientific evidence is no, don't. Don't put sealers, just let it heal naturally. So anyway, again, this tree, I'm gonna kind of assume that we're gonna maybe leave it to try to get back to that central leader. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm gonna be pretty gentle. Again, uh, Rob is exactly right. Everybody, it's a little bit of an art. Everybody has a little different philosophy. I would say I tend to be a more gentle or lighter pruner. But again, just getting rid of stuff that's gonna possibly grow into the center, keep oriented towards moving things out. Um, what about those? Uh... This guy. Oh, okay. And now my angle isn't quite good, but there's nothing I can do about that. This one's coming in. These are a bunch of suckers coming off the rootstock. And these you basically want to get rid of. Some people call them water spouts or suckers. Can I get you to hold, mm -hmm. just hold that? And I would just come right in here and knock all of that out. Now, if those regrow during the year, we just knock them out. Just, them. just keep pruning them off. And again, this is going to be a little bit of a question. What do you want to take? What do you want to keep? What do you want to get rid of? And again, I'm going to be fairly light. Just trying to keep the center, in this case, as open as possible to air. It will do, it will do better. Let's get rid of this guy. So, as I look at it, I think, I think my natural tendency is to like that open, open center base thing. And I can, and I'm, I'm sort of almost unconsciously just moving it more back towards that that uh, open center where we'll have maybe one, two, maybe a good scaffold here. And I think I'm actually going to take this off. Again, I'm going to try to get close to that collar, but not into it. Uh, that didn't work so good. Like a little platter. Yeah. Let's see if we can just get that back a little bit and smooth out. Nope, that didn't do any better. I think it'll be okay. It's going to shed water nicely. This guy is a question down here. And for now, I'm just going to leave it. And let's see what it looks like when it leaves out in the summer. And tree that has a totally different issue with it. It just has all those water suckers that Mike was talking about a moment ago. Most of what you see here just needs to be cut out because it's grown off the rootstock and has nothing to do with anything that will produce fruit and it will actually take vigor away from the part here that is what we want to save. And you can see the suckers, the water spouts have been cut off and we've exposed the core tree that's still here. And there is some other pruning that could happen on this tree. There are things in the center, there are things crisscrossing. You have a nice central leader growing up tall here. Um, and there's not a whole lot of other. Up to the collar as much as I can. Take this one off. Yeah. Here, you want a hand? You got it, yeah. And then maybe I might 
might even just leave the rest. Do you see anything else? I don't know. I don't think it would be. I don't think it would be wrong to just take this whole thing off and okay, leave, go ahead. Yep. leave this tree. That, that's good. To to grow up with one central leader. Good. There you go. It's Voila. free. <laughs> <laughs> that tree has been winter pruned. <laughs> We have some cherry trees here in the orchard. In fact, there are four larger ones, and then there are two or three of these smaller that are planted next to the larger ones. Cherry is one of those trees, as you heard in the uh, presentation, that you don't do winter pruning. Um, and so these are a bit out of control. They're tall. There's a lot of stuff that needs to be done, but this will be need to be done in July. Here we have a row of citrus trees. And as we discussed earlier, citrus trees don't really need to be pruned. However, some of these are getting a little tall. And some of it is starting to grow over the pathway here. So I am going to cr prune that, not for the health of the tree, but really because I'm trying to shape it away from the path. So uh, we're now in my orchard here in Arroyo Grande. This is also a young orchard. This is about the fourth year of this orchard um, and also has had some issues with uh, some, some setbacks. In, in our case, it wasn't water, it was, it was more deer, which came in and did some pretty good devastation. But we've got some examples of trees that we both rehab to some extent and give you an idea of, of what a final pruning looks like. This is a Santa Rosa plum here that, uh, that we're focused on. And you can see it's been We've, we've topped it. The, the purpose there is to try to keep everything down low enough that we don't have to start getting up on heavy ladders um, to, to get the fruit. And then again, it's, it's been pruned mainly to, towards that, that vase configuration. You can see how things are pointing up and out and trying to keep the center very open for, for airflow. And we'll see how this grows and then uh, prune it some more in the in the summer. Um, here's another tree. This is a persimmon. And th this is actually somewhat of a, I would say, modified central leader versus vase configuration. But again, um, it's been pruned to um, try to open up the center for airflow, to eliminate crossing and dead stuff. And um, uh, I think this one will do will do pretty well. Um, we also have over here. This is a this is a quince. And what I discovered, this tree is about in its fourth year, and it, it it grows wild. It is a crazy wild grower. So you can see I've done like major pruning back of this of this tree, but again trying to to, to top it to open it, to get rid of crossing and dead. Any questions from the chat, Peggy? Okay, so thank you all for that excellent presentation. Um, we don't have any specific questions yet. I'll let give people a minute to go ahead and type in any questions you have. Um, also, since we um, have a a smaller group, we may be able to have you raise your hands and unmute and ask questions. Uh, but just to let you know, there were a couple comments in the chat that Bay Laurel Nursery does carry low chill hour fruit trees. So if someone is looking for low chill hour, and as well, Mike commented that Cherry Lane Nursery in Royal Grande has also been able to um, uh, acquire trees for him that he was looking for. Um, so there is one question come in. Um, has the recent warm weather made the, the wrong time to prune some fruit trees? I don't know who wants to take that question? Well, I would say you got to judge by the tree. If it's uh, if it's starting like for the uh, newly planted, I'll speak to the newly planted uh, tree. If you've just planted it, you've got to prune it. Um, ideally, you wanted to do it before bud break, but I think you got to do it anyhow. And at least the good news is we do have, I mean, good news, bad news. We've got dry weather for seven days ahead of us, then, um, then you're safe. 
What would you say, Mike? Yeah, I jump in. I would agree. Um, it's, it's an excellent question. I'm not 100% sure of the answer. Uh, my my guess is that uh, you should just go ahead and prune, um, even though you know maybe starting to to bud break. Um, I don't think the I don't think the warm weather will make that much of a difference in the pruning where it would be much more important is uh, something Rob alluded to earlier in terms of the maintenance of the trees. Most of these stone fruit trees require dormant um, spraying of some sort for pests and fungus. Um, ideally, you probably um, want to spray with both a dormant, what's called a dormant oil spray uh, or a horticultural oil all, and alternate that with a uh, fungicide like a, a, a copper spray. Um, in particular, peaches, uh, nectarines, any of those types of fruits absolutely require um, spraying in order to avoid peach leaf curl. And I'm making a short answer way too long, but I, uh, they would be much more sensitive and you probably can't really do a lot of spraying once they start to, to break bud, to leaf out and to flower. It, it depends on the spray, it depends on the tree, but in general, um, you, you wanna try to get your spraying done while they are still dormant. So in that respect, the warm weather and, and an early bud break may be a bit of a problem with respect to getting your trees sprayed. Okay, we, and we do have some more questions coming in, but just to clarify, is it too late to spray if the buds are breaking right now? It, it, depends, it depends on the tree. You need to look at the instructions on the, uh, on the particular spray. Some, some of them actually, uh, you, certain trees and certain sprays, you may actually be spraying them as they flower. But, mm -hmm. but as, a, as a general rule, um, most of them, once once they start to break bud and once they start to flower, you're you're probably not um, not going to spray. Okay, and then we have a question about the espalier, Sandra. What spacing do you use for the cables? Oh, the I think the recommendation is um, six, at least sixteen inches. Um, I think that's what I used as well. Uh, but there, it, um, I think that is referenced in, uh, I would, I would Google that, but I believe it's 16 inches. Okay, very good. Um, any comments about how to prune a pomegranate? Yeah, do whatever you want. <laughs> prune it hard. Prune it hard, do whatever you want. You could prune very it to... Tough. You can prune it to look like a bush. You can prune it to be a multi trug tree. Do whatever the heck you want on pomegranate. You can espalier them also. There's an espaliered pomegranate in the uh, demonstration garden. And I pruned that this year and I pruned it down to, I pruned it very hard, but because it's going to fruit on first year wood, it doesn't matter. Anything that comes out of it is going to fruit. So you can't make a mistake on the pomegranate. That's good news. Um, what type of paint can you talk about for the whitewash again? So that was in my section. Uh, it's a, a, I haven't done it yet this year, but it's a recommended la it's exterior latex water-based paint. And um, I believe water-based and latex are the same thing. You don't want an acrylic paint. That's I think the important and thing. And you wanna uh, dilute that 50%? By 50% before you put it on. Okay. And, um, oh yes, thank you for putting up the last slide. Um, while we're waiting for any more questions to come in, uh, we're, we just have a minute left, but um, there is the, um, uh, the link to go ahead and um, do the evaluation. I'm going to put it back in the chat box again, the link for everyone to um, click on. You can click on it right from the chat box and it will open up the window for you. So now's easy time to do that. Um, the person with the pomegranate question said, thank you for the, for the freedom to prune away. So uh, we appreciate that answer. Um, any other comments or questions anyone wants to chat in? 
Uh, any other final comments from our speakers today? Well, Fun. thank you for, um, for sorry, sorry, Mike. No. Thank you for your attention. We, you know, this is the first Zoom style uh, advice mm -hmm. to grow by. We had a few little glitches, but I think it went, you know, reasonably well. We've learned a lot. And yeah. thank, thank you to Gary Peterson for editing the video. Yes, yes. Awesome. thank you, Gary. Thank yeah, you. and again, have fun. Yeah, it's a team effort and we're glad that everyone signed on. So I want to thank everyone, thank all of our speakers and Gary as well for our video editing expertise. And uh, we'd love to hear your comments about how we can do the next Zoom ATGB until we are free to all see you all in person. So thank you very much and have a great day. Happy pruning. So Peggy, um, we have to stop recording. Okay. Let me see if we can get Maria to.